So recently I was playing a game called Mario Hoops 3 on 3 and uh yeah just roll the dang montage I did not know Mario was allowed to be that cool. Game has Final Fantasy characters in it too for no reason other than shut up it's fun and while it's not exactly a gameplay masterpiece it did make me realize that the DS is really the coolest Nintendo will ever be. Edgy, dingy horror games, deep heady mystery adventures, the best Mario Kart, Final Fantasy RTS, gambling the night away with Luigi, a touchscreen before it would become the norm, Picto Chat, tons of stylish JRPGs, 3D brain head man, the Sonic Rush games, and the Sonic RPG by Bioware that sounds incredible. Uh, I will defend this OST one day. And yes, you will be allowed to unsubscribe when I do. Phoenix Wright, 999, Desert Twin Peaks with Aliens, aka The Sims 2, Why Is It Like That, Aesthetic Need for Speed, The Most Underrated GTA, A Trip Inside of Bowser's Bowels, and Goddamn Mother Heckin' Touch Dick. The DS truly could not be stopped. Off the Richter on the cool skill, and to make it even better, it was also region free and super easy to pirate for. Emulates flawlessly too. How neat. Very convenient. Thanks, Nintendo. Anyway, uh, y'all heard about Tingle? Nintendo hit this from us. Just like Fatal Frame 4 and Disaster Day of Crisis, ripened Tingle Balloon Strip of Love sits among the gallons of games Reggie doesn't want Americans to know about. But I got you guys though, trust me. <laughs> I guess when you're a kitty company, <laughs> this game do be a little bit <laughs> too edgy. Too edgy. The story is essentially a retelling of the Apple Pippin game Yellow Brick Road. As in that the titular road is in the game and also Straw Child, Metal Bitch and shit. Only instead of a FMV nightmare, it's pretty much just cute adventures and situations the game. Mainly due to your freak buddies who are all adorable. From the antsy but still tough for his size Kakashi, who through various hijinks becomes more and more confident as you save him from peril. Or the robot lady who wants nothing to do with you cause robot but because of her constant tech issues friendship does begin to occur. To of course the lion who ain't all like but is instead a big tough strong huge coward and actually fierce thing. And together they must travel the lands along the road to reach the city to find love stopping at all manner of cozy towns and places along the way. It has a strong Final Fantasy 9 or Paper Mario energy where it's like yeah Sure, it's not the greatest story ever told, but the world and characters are both so charming and interesting that it makes the journey the destination in and of itself. Friends along the way type shit. With everything looking small, adorable, artistic and cute, with cozy farms and the dusky tractor ride that follows it, and a spooky forest, a wholesome train station and an overgrown tree town. That very same picturesque energy I mentioned when Tulip is in here in full force. Mainly because, just like Tulip, this game is also a love to like. <coughs> Yo! Hit him with the chart! Love the lick these nuts. So Love the Lick is the studio behind Moon and LOL, who then post Dreamcast broke up into many smaller ventures. Punchline, who did Rule of Rose and Tulip, Onion Games, who are the most current incarnation, Akira Ueda and his crew, who at Grasshopper, went on to do the equally legendary DS game Contact, which, yes, I will most definitely talk about someday. And also Vanpool, who first did Moon 2, aka Indonesia, and then later made Tingle Game. All different devs with different games, but a very strong style and ethos that has been there since day one. Stories about making the world better just through being nice, but also that you're an outcast from society because society has issues. And gameplay that enforces these themes through embracing the mundane and the tedium with which it comes. Whether it be house cleaning for Chibi Robo or dying at every step in Tulip, more on this in Moon Video. So yeah, th this Tingle game is Love the Lick to a T, as it is about some deadbeat person downbeaten by society beating down by punching up through beating off, aka spreading love. 
Tingle in his cute dumpy little apartment with the lippy waltzy bungus music opening up to a world better off than he is and looking down upon him for it. But finding fellow freaks and outcasts to go on adventures with regardless. Just like Moon, especially just like Tulip, shit is very there and I am very here for it. As every animation, every sound effect, every comfy quirky tune in the OST has that trademark weirdness to it. Like, <laughs> just look at the save point. Though, luckily, unlike many love the likes, it's not a game with obtuse timers or annoying progress requirements or long waiting times or sudden death, as it is instead a pretty typical point and click adventure game wholly played with the touchscreen. Not a very difficult one either, but still inventive nonetheless. For instance, it has some pretty basic inventory puzzles, but rather than just making you combine garbage, it'll make you collect certain types of flowers with various leaf amounts amounting to a certain number of leaves, thus making the item the puzzle in and of itself. Or how the screwdriver results in a little mini game where you need to speed nut some bolts and tight screw some holes, and a lot of other times there'll just be some neat interactables. Switching the big red switch behind the switching statues you can shower, become scarecrow, hit the sign with a slingshot, kick the fruit from the tree, and so on. Stuff like this makes the puzzles overall feel environmental. Less big detached inventory list of shit, and more items that are a part of where you are and are attached to who you are dealing with. And of course, there's also the love push, i.e. giving gifts to bitches, buyable with rupees and rupees is everywhere, nor can you really fail much or nothing, it is just there to be cute. Kinda Sussington how in the tutorial it makes you do it on a little girl, but the character descriptions hint at this being super platonic for the FEMOIDS! With some being married or hella old and just sort of seeing Tingle as Oh, he's such a lovely man, but nothing else, which I honestly think is a sort of wholesome and non-creepy weirdo way of doing this. Regardless of the faces that Tingle makes, it's not sexual or perverted or even romantic in nature. It's simply about finding some homies and dashing away the narrow-minded societal views on who may be homieable. It's good. It's simple. It's easy. Not like profound or overly complex, but good. Besides, the game's also genuinely really funny. Homie here playing the ocarina. all of the well-timed visual gags and general ridiculous moments, it, it's got great comedic timing grouping all over the animations that pair with the puzzles, not to mention the writing having oodles of charm. All of which is thankfully very perceivable due to the excellent fan translation. Hell, because of it was also region free and super easy to pirate for. Emulates flawlessly too, we got buckets of fan translations for this very video, which should make this easier for me to do too. I did have this one awkward moment though where the quiz quizzing guy to answer Japanese, so I thought answer Japanese, but actually answer English because the folks who made the translation are good people. Unlike me, dumb people. Don't be dumb people. Stupido. Basura brain. Idiota. Over the years, I've said hella about how low-poly, low-textures benefit certain settings and vibes. Whether it be the cluttery, dense, living nature of a jungle setting, or the obscured, detail-centric claustrophobia of horror, and how details can stick out more in generally more lower-detailed environments, thus making it rife for potentially focused and easily directed exploration. Indies have clearly caught on to this too in recent years, but very early examples of this post-PS1 being done are on the DS, as that had a very similar texture warping. Dementium being one of the better known examples, starting off as a Silent Hill pitch, but rejected back into basic bitch. It is a rather steam horror gamey ass game. Exploring barely lit, dingy urban areas as the story is practically non-existent. 
because it was ripped off of its intended license, so they had to make up some fuck shit fighting for style. And the big monster man thing is patrolling the halls. I'm reminded of titles like Nightmare House or any number of shitstorm bangers. Definitely plays like one. Very much ahead of its time, and I also think the remastered re-releases really show just how much value there is in a game looking this way. Want me? Come on over and get me free cats, right? A little closer. Wait, you're not one of them? Oh man, we're gonna go! Plus, it's DS-centric as shit, using the touchscreen bigly, which would also all be lost too. Though, in that, it does feature the DS's features in rather typical ways, where I think horror could have really benefited from being more experimental in a dragging the player into the game meta sort of way. I mean, Nanashi no game is exactly that, for instance. Being a horror game on the DS about being a horror game on the DS through its focus on a game in the DS within the horror game on the DS. The Nameless Game is the game within Nanashi no Game, Japanese for Nameless Game. It's a little NES style RPG that, while normal on the surface, has the ability to trap the player inside. Inside of the game. Inside of the game. Inside of the game, inside of IRL though, you maneuver 3D environments in first person in order to figure out who, what, why this game in-game while dodging many ghosts. There's no combat, there is puzzles, but mostly there is walking very slowly and triggering events that make one switch game and flip DS to play the NES game in DS in-game. Again. Uh, yeah, I, I talked about the first game, so I'm not gonna talk about it here, but I am gonna talk about the second game as if it is the first game, as it basically is. Same gameplay, similar scenario, nearly identical story, reused assets and regurgitated sound effects, but really, really horrible character portraits that make this one look downright cheap in comparison. Though, still fine. I I'd say the first game is better, just cause the sequel is more of the same, but not per se a gooder game, both in-game and in-in-game, but still the same. Has some real eldritch fucking controls and incredible sound design that both combine to make the horror fucking excellent. Every step you take feels like a commitment. Every turn like a drunken stumble. Every ruffle, bump, or random knock a potential scare. I felt as if I was in quicksand while strutting, and so... When the whole mode of gameplay is running from things while feeling way too big for most of the locales getting stuck on door frames and corners, knowing that looking behind you is too much of a risk and waste of potential steps, it, it, it really, with controls this sluggish, it could have made anything seem stressful as shit, but it doesn't just use anything. It uses loud, beefy, bit-crushy, nearby neural audio and trigger-based scares and slow-thumping exploration all topped off by this haunted little pixel game that glitches and freaks the fuck out in realistic ways with the catchiest, weirdly saddest, fuckiest theme that weaves in and out of the game and game into the game like a scary wind on a stormy night. All of this can be said as much about one as it can two to be true, but it do tell you that two is at least just as good. If only that the novelty is a tad stronger the first time around.
Of course, the true horror of the Nintendo DS is the fact that someone made a game with Boba 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 Bo in it and then kept it to themselves. I guess there's also some JoJo's and Dragon Balls and One Pieces, but I don't fucking watch anime. Who do you think I am? A weeb? I just like Japanese games and architecture and some music and maybe some anime. But you won't ever hear me admit to that. This game though, Defo does admit to it, as it boasts the most of Shonen Jumps jumping around on screen at once. Shonen Jump being like, uh, you fucking know. But it's that thing where all the anime comes out of with the colorful cast of characters fighting all the time as motherfuckers stand along the sidelines explaining what's going on, which is pretty much what this game is too. You fight all the time on one screen as manga panels of folks yelling about it are on the other. Oh shit. He's doing the Sonic run. Forest Fighters Go Though Jump Ultimate Stars is sort of like Smash. Bigger vertical platforming stages, pretty distinct set of moves linked to buttons linked to movements, weak attacks, strong attacks, the usual more beat em up -y shit, fun floaty jumping, and edges you can knock motherfuckers off of and into. However, unlike Smash, you do have regular ass health, and there is also a special bar for specials. Simple at its core, but not dummy baby shit, basically. And what really gives it its initial oomph is the animations. You see, these ain't your typical snappy type of attacks, these are bigly animated as these manga may motherfuckers would be, and so a long ass attack animation also has a long ass window in which you can get your ass beat, and with 41 characters in its roster all with their own unique attacks and therefore animations, there's certainly a lot to dig into here. I don't know if it's balanced exactly, it's definitely more of a bonker balls fighting party game than something I'd imagine seeing at EVO, but it's still very fun. Thing is, is that it has many cool intricacies that play with how it plays. For example, to block, you need to hold down, but you can't do that while going up, i.e. being in the air, which in this very jumpy game with platformer-like stages instantly adds a bit of depth to how one treats their whereabouts in regards to whereabouts your enemy would be. All characters also have attributes attributes like smarts or strengths that have this under the hood rock paper scissory thing and the manga panel shit isn't just for show either it is your manga deck in a sort of rpg like fashion you earn panels like cards that can be assembled upgraded collected and whatever the fuck over the course of the entire game that are tappable during battle letting one activate anything from a dynamic character switch to a special summon aoe type beat there is a lot that goes into this, with things like the sequence in which you place them making differences hellily, to the point where I don't even want to explain it, because in a goddamn tutorial, there's a fucking fan translation for those and you can use it, but it is neat. Something about having to tap the touchscreen during this otherwise very non-DS gimmicky heavy game does feel a bit unwieldy, but for A, I can't fault it for trying something different, and for B, it also ties into the game playing with how it plays as even a switch can be attack and you can combo the switches into combo switch attack, comboing those with combos. It's good. Game does feel a tad stiff overall, largely due to how the animations is handled, and I'm also not the keenest on how insane its stipulations for unlocking characters can be. I, I just wanted to play as Boba Boy. But hey, game is okay. And honestly, the whole like progression system is pretty satisfying with one upgrading moves, aka the manga panels, and getting new playable characters out of it and stages at the same time. They all got their own little skill trees and you can get points to satisfyingly buy your way through the game in a manner that feels really complex, involved, and intricate. So, the Sims 2 DS is one of those things I've always either wanted to talk about or see someone whose videos I like talk about, as it's such a weird anomaly of a game, being that it is not The Sims 2. It is a story-driven title about you arriving in a small desert town that houses many eerie mysteries. Aliens, creepy basement dungeons, a spooky hotel, and generally just a palpable fucking mysterioso atmosphere. The music and sound effects for one are, well, they're not really what I think of when I think The Sims, and the town seems primarily lawless and abandoned with the hotel not having an owner or any electricity, and there also being nuclear rods chilling about the place. It's like, yeah, sure, you got your sim things, but also tons of stuff that make this more of an adventure game than anything else slowly peeling away at this town's little secrets day by day. 
it's defo worth revisiting and talking about more someday for sure but i think for now i want to bring it up as a way to highlight that the ds's library just kind of did whatever the fuck it wanted guess because of the player base and the ds being very cheap to develop for more experimental or adult focused games were less of a risk than they would have been elsewhere and so, instead of an SMT game about high schoolers, you got one about the entire Earth dying and you being part of a team going into the fucktest zone to fix shit. The tones are cold, dark, and the music is ever ominous and never as peppy or rocky as even the edgiest of SMTs tend to be. There were also devs like Sing creating slow-ass, well-written-ass games about normal-ass people doing normal-ass things in very interesting-ass ways. Yeah, another code might star a teenage girl, but it's a teenage girl written by an adult woman and from said perspective. Not in that fellow kidsy way neither, but in a manner where it's written like how adults view teenagers and reflect on having been them. There's no isms in this game. Same way that it may have had to have if it were an effort more concerned with profits. And of course, this freedom also led to games that were basically just applications when you get right down to it. Brain training, touch dick, my weight loss coach type shit. And of course... So, uh, this is, uh, like a thing used for training McDonald's employees in Japan, I think. Nowadays, this would be app, but in a weirdly ahead of a time type of move, they put this pitch on the DS. And it's weirdly sandwich. Some really high quality sounds, cute animations, simple repetitive actions. This almost makes working at McDonald's seem sort of nice. And all they had to do to achieve that was remove the yelling customers and the smell and the feeling like a greasy piece of human garbage. So like Nick Robinson all day and your dickhead manager who thinks he's hot shit and the yelling customers. Uh. I've never worked at McDonald's, but I've heard the stories. This game is a lie. A filthy, gross, corporate, capitalist lie that's weirdly fun for what it is. Unlike the others though, it's certainly not something you could buy and even if you could, I doubt many would. Cause I mean, hey, if touching decade your speed, then mayhaps I could interest you in some English of the dead. Okay, 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 uh, yeah, I, <laughs> I can't play this game. This is a game about teaching English to folks who only know Japanese, and I don't know Japanese, and that's a problem with a fair few of these games, to be honest. Take Sigma Harmonics, a game I really wanted to dedicate more time to, but just straight up couldn't due to how unique its gameplay is and me not being able to simply suss it out. As amazing as fuck music and vibes though, Masashi Hamazu 2AT. There's also Project Hacker, a cool VN about hacking with amazing tunes that nearly made it overseas but for unstated reasons just simply never did. Not even through fans, which stands out as there's leaders of visual novels that did get fan trend. Tokimeki Boy Edition 3, Date Tennis Man Game, and the mother hecking This Guy Married His DS Lamau mid-2000s article tier classic Love Plus. A game that lives on in infamy as the one that perverts got really, 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 really into for a few years back then. However, I don't know if I'd go as far as to say that. It, it's definitely not hentai at all. You're just hanging out with really fleshed out characters. And so in a country where many folks is a little lonely, that simply resonated a lot. Basically, it's an expansion of what Tokimeki Memorial did, even down to the scrolling tiles. Has hella comfy vibes, a lot of repeating loops cause day system student life, a very nice clean UI design that fits the various moods, but it is a little bit more focused. Tokimeki is like a really numbers ass RPG ass game when you get right down to it. Hella bitches, hella paths, tons of classes and events, and this, well, that has three girls and four stats. It's less so about playing the game over and over to see all of the things and date all of the girls, and more so about actually forming a type of bond with one of them. Hence why some dude up and married the damn game. A lot of it is also automated, sorta. 
Like you, pick your activities back at room at the start of the day, hit the auto text, text speed on fast, and boom, the game just sort of goes. Stats being earned, events being happened, cute little songs and crunchy little sound effects whiz on by. As I've stated, it's very comfy, and yet it moves quite fast too. I mean, you fucking blast through these days with bars going up in tow. It has an arcadiness to its systems rather than a hard rpg -ness, which I imagine set it apart from its contemporaries a fair amount. Conversations also have this casual tone to them too. Not a whole lot of complicated options it hits you with, certainly not right away, and your pro tag has a sense of humor and isn't just a full-on blank slate, which is also sort of unusual for the genre. The game has character, pretty much, which I'd say is pretty important for a game centered wholly around its characters, and as a result, I can see it tapping into a, what was, at the time, a more modern zeitgeist. Not using fantasy or super unrealistic, always dashing pretty boys, or a sort of boomery traditional idol archetypes, but a bit more down to earth and chill, and even including texting and shit. And given the speedy gameplay loop and high density of events and bar go up, it's also really addicting. I, I straight up got sucked into this thing for several hours and I didn't even notice. By the end, I was all like, yeah, I can do one more day and then do it again and again and again. And again, and again, uh, maybe this is sort of manipulative. Cause like, if it can do this to me, then I dread to think what this can do to a lonely Japanese neat with no one to actually talk to or anything else to do. Bring them comfort, perhaps, but it won't get them out of that loop either. Though, uh, no, it is absolutely not some creepy pervert thing. There's a lot to be said about it being set in a high school, of course, and about it turning love into a game and the very little objectification that that brings by default, but the former is more of a cultural thing rather than solely a creepo thing, as it is much more complicated than that, and the latter seems to be simply a side effect and hopefully not an intent. The only intent I can see being displayed here is simply delivering a very sweet, good, fun, comfy time with some really well-written characters, all with subplots and plot plots that don't even necessarily pertain to dating them, but just to them being them. Even if its smash hit popularity in Japan was more than just a lucky break. Dragon Ball Kai Ultimate Butoden features the return of the Butoden series since the 1997 game Dragon Ball GT Final Bout. Uh, okay. We need to talk about this now as Ooh, Vegeta Bebe. With Ultimate Butoden being the official sequel to Final Bout, I am left with no choice but to compare these two no doubt masterpieces. And GT is definitely a tough act to follow. I mean, it might be the stiffest 3D fighting game this side of Toshinden as even moving feels like trying to walk with mannequin legs, let alone doing anything else. It has epic beam struggles and the never quite explained mechanics that come with them, an amazing soundtrack, beautiful full painterly pixelated backgrounds, chunky PS1 models, bootleg voice acting, <laughs> and also fuck you giant monkey! And Butoden has this extremely goopery retelling of the DBC plot with some adorable models and mini musics, which considering that Bout has no story is already a pretty strong dink in its favor. However, what FB does have is this impressive skill to be really fundamentally frustrating in a way not many games can even dare to be, due to how horrid the game feel is. I mean, every movement is like you're trying to break away from the shackles of molasses. Like, you can see my character sort of judder forward here and there. That's me trying to break free, which can be funny, but is also really fucking frustrating most of the time. It's quite genius, really. And Butoden honors this by taking Jump Ultimate's weird-ass touchscreen special moves, but also letting you do them through button. Button good? Yes, in fact, it handles really well. Super smooth and fast and goodly animated. I was just hammering away at the buttons like a dumbass as all sort of cool moves were strung together in this well-flowing manner as the camera zooms in and out and snaps out the lively backgrounds with all kinds of dope effects and blurs and intensities. It feels as good to play as it looks. Would you drink the Piccolo Funny Milk? Now, the secret key to GT was of course the act of holding down R1 to dash and spamming kick until forever. Sure, you can try to do some cool shit like this Kamehameha I blasted off into fucking nowhere, but what I soon found out afterwards is that 
Well, this is the goaded strat right here. Even mashing doesn't really work given how obtuse and precise the inputs tend to be. Thing is, is that GT intuits nothing and beholds to no known traditions. Button mashing want to shit for you, you either know or you don't. And luckily, Butoten seems like the exact polar opposite. For starters, it has a tutorial despite not even really needing one to begin with as it's a super simple game. Her body has a regular attack button, a non-regular attack button, a key blast button, a parry button, and a grab button from which you chain shits together and do moves also easily triggered by just tapping the touchscreen, but it's legit really fun. Very fast, full of blasts as you whisk past and blast ass, ending it with a throw and grab. Unlike Final Bout, where mashing repetitive attacks feels like an exploit, it is, here, more or less, the whole ass mode of play resulting in a screen splashing with vibrancy and DBZ. And if that ain't a design evolution, then I don't know what is. And I'd say the same for the character roster. GT has Little Goku, and Son Goku, and Super Saiyan Goku, and Super Goku. It, it, you gotta have Super Goku. But Butoten has everything from Robot Freeze to fucking Dodoria and Zarbon. We'll give GT one thing legit though, and that's that everyone plays differently tedious in their own respective ways. For Goku walking menacingly as if an unfazed tank, small characters actually being small and really fucking hard to hit, Cell being as stiff as he looks, it's all there. Which ain't the case for Bhutan, as everyone pretty much handles in the exact same way. Cosmetically different, but the inputs and the general feeling of the animations that result from them is all largely consistent across the board. Though, props to the variety of playables in the story mode regardless. I mean, most DBZ story modes tend to default to whoever is the main guy at that time, so you end up playing as Gohan, Goku, Piccolo, and Vegeta for pretty much the entire fucking thing, despite these games often having many more characters. But this one is like, ah, oh, fuck it, you get to be Zarbon, or Shoutsu, or Yamcha. The Ginyu fight was also legit really neat, as the chain stuff plays into the fight rather than it simply being a cutscene in between, constantly switching between playing as Goku or Ginyu with you actually losing when you beat yourself up, as I did at first. Shit banged, and that's basically what I'm gonna say about the game as a whole. It's good, simple, fun, looks great, has hella modes that I can't read, and has this cool frog screen. And yeah, that's about where I'm gonna end this bitch, I feel. Not really much of an overarching point other than, dang, <laughs> the DS was pretty cool. Boasts tons of classics and weird ass spin offs and sequels that we never would have gotten without it. Plus, it's weirdly more of a PS1 2 than a N64 2 despite having a few ports because of how it rendered 3D in a similar way and allowed for a similar mixed media like experimentation with the pre renders and the touch dick. I think, if anything, this video showcases just how much actually did get released too. There's no real golden goose egg racing lagoons or supreme hidden gems, and when those are there, you can bet your ass that they'll have fan translations, like Love Plus, Tingle, and many others have. Which, we also have the large install base, aka piracy, thank you pirates, to thank for. For me, personally though, it was also one of the first systems I can actually remember being fully hyped for from reveal on to release. The PS2 just sort of appeared one day, and the PS1 was always there from my POV, but the DS had that fucking reveal with the dope ass, unplayable looking ass 3D Sonic Runner game with the crazy camera angles and fucking Metroid Prime Hunters. I barely even knew what the heck a Metroid was, but it looked dope as all hell, and I wanted it. Even gave me my first online experiences with Mario Kart and Animal Crossing, so yeah, I'm gonna thank the DS too for simply being pretty dang good. Why is he like this? And why can't nobody stop him? <laughs>